I joined IWC in 2004 when it was very small. Since then we have grown and today IWC has, has more than 13,000 clients. We were named Aboriginal Medical Service in the year of 2016, which we were very proud of. And we provide services to more than 90% of the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander population in our region. <coughs> I am part of the Medical Centre and work as, a, as an Indigenous Health Practitioner uh, within the Medical Centre. It's a very hands-on role and Kirsty and I work with the community every day. We see diabetes in its most severe forms and try to empower our patients to manage it in the most proactive way. Morning. That's okay, everyone can hear me? Yeah. So uh, my name is Kirsty Hart and I'm the uh, coordinator for health initiatives at IWC Medical Centre. So I've uh, been with IWC Medical since 2011 and have been an Indigenous health practitioner for the past four years. So um, Lisa and I are here today to talk about an exciting trial IWC has been delivering over the past year which is offering a new option for monitoring glucose for our Indigenous patients with diabetes. So the aim of the trial was to identify whether there could be a viable alternative for Indigenous patients to the finger pricking lancet that is commonly used to self-monitor glucose levels. So first of all, what we use. So we use the Libra Reader and Sensor from Anna Australia. Have any of you heard of the Libra Reader and Sensor? Yeah. Couple at the back. So um, this is called the reader. That one. And it's uh, it's a it's called a reader and not a glucose meter, as it reads glucose that's present between the cells, so not glucose in the blood. So it's very important to realise that this reading can be five to ten minutes behind a glucose reading taken from the finger. So the two will not match if taken at the same time. And just above that is the sensor. So the sensor is about the size of a 20 cent piece and it is applied to the outer arm. It has a small needle in the applicator, but this is retracted back and doesn't stay in the arm. It stays on the arm by a strong adhesion that surrounds the sensor and then the sensor stays there for two weeks and it takes a reading of glucose every 15 minutes. So when the sensor is attached, you can shower, even go swimming with it on. So let me show you how it works. This is just a um, demo one we've been given from Abbott Australia to borrow. So that's the sensor there. So I'll just get Lisa to hold it on her arm. So you probably place it around this area? Yeah. Turn it on. And then by swiping the sensor past the reader. Hear that little bit. And my sugar's, my sugar's good. Yeah. And then it shows you readings on a sugar level. So, um, and then all the readings that were saved in the sensor are then transferred to the reader. And then um, all the information in the reader can be downloaded to a computer. And um, you can see what's been happening with that patient's glucose over the past two weeks. So, um, that's I pass it around. Can it go on the clothes? No, it doesn't no, on the skin. Yeah. 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 Do you want to, do you want to stand up? Oh, yeah. oh she's Sorry. later. She's later. Oh, oh, oh she? Yeah. Oh, right. Right. Um, so, what we did. So, our medical centre doctors were happy to support the program. That's them up there. Um, and we also asked our Indigenous patients if they wanted to take part of this trial. Our workplace the Indigenous Wellbeing Centre bought two freestyle um, Libra readers from Abbott Australia through the, our local ITC program, what Bob talked about earlier. They gave us some funding to cover the costs of each of the sensors um, for each of the clients. <coughs> we did the necessary paperwork and kept spreadsheets to keep track. So what we did. Uh, the number of clients were limited to 11 with 12 sensors. This was a smallish but significant amount of, um, because these are some of the patients who were finding it difficult for a range of reasons to follow through on their regular, like finger pricking things, um, our glucose checks, and it gave us also a good starting point. 
So we started the trial back in October 2017 and we've continued since then. Our age range was 36 years old to 76 years of age and the gender breakdown was 27% males to 73% females. Um, our patients in the program used a range of tablets and injections to manage their diabetes. We recorded their HbA1c's prior to commencing the, the program and any changes um, that were made after. Um, when we recorded, we also recorded whether the application was of the sensor was painful, um, if it was comfortable to wear, and if it stayed on for the whole like 14 days. Um, sometimes we put a second sensor on the client um, to double check the changes we had made in the insulin. So the practicality of wearing the sensor was also important. 75% of the group did not have any issues with the sensor, um, but 17% found the application of the sensor was uncomfortable at times. Um, and also a few days after, but only 8% of the patients removed the sensor themselves. 25% um, of the sensors fell off or were knocked off by the end of the, the two week period, but 75% of the, the sensors lasted the full 14 days. So what did we find? So this is, this is some crazy um, stats that we found. So 60% of our participants were experiencing undetected hypos that they didn't know they were having. Um, and of these, 85% were undetected nighttime hypos when they were sleeping. They had no <coughs> idea they were having hypos. 60% um, of our participants also experienced hy hypoglycemia, glycemia, <coughs> which was also mostly undetected. Some participants had both highs and lows. We saw from this small study an average reduction in HbA1c levels of 1.7%. This is despite significantly reducing the amount of insulin giving, provided to the patient. We also did some research um, around undetected hypoglycemia, and what we learned from that was the number of severe hypos can increase the longer the patient has type 2 diabetes. Um, nighttime hypo hypos may be the most common form of hypos in uh, individuals using insulin. Um, undetected nighttime hypos can cause prolonged periods of heart rhythm um, disturbances in older patients in type 2 diabetes. Um, but this research has also shown that nighttime hypos can be difficult to detect. And some of our patients may not want to talk about them. Sometimes people do wake up with a headache, having disturbed <coughs> sleeps, sheets being damp from sweat and feeling tired. And that's from them undetected nighttime hypos that they were having, not knowing. So next, what are we doing about it? Um, so first of all, we've been changing treatment for the patients involved in the trial. In particular, we are reducing the amount of insulin they are administering at night. Our diabetes educator is providing in-house training to IWC health professionals around detecting these nighttime lows. We are educating our team to ask the questions needed to identify what we have found is happening through our trial. In this way, we are working to improve the health and well-being of our patients across the board. So we're really starting to question our clients who have had type 2 diabetes for say longer than five years um, about their nighttime sleep patterns. So for example, we're asking are you waking up during the night? Or is someone waking you up? Are you eating through the night? Are you waking up in the morning with a headache? Do you usually sleep deeply or have a very disturbed sleep? Are the sheets or your PJs ever damp from sweat in the morning? So IWC is planning to continue this work around the liver reader and sensor, which is progressing very fast. I will speak more about this shortly. First, I'd just like to share a couple of stories from uh, some patients who took part in the program. So the first story was from a gentleman who was diagnosed with diabetes over 20 years ago. And in his words, he said, 
The whole thing was very straightforward for me. It was the best thing I've ever used. This has made me realise for the first time, even after all the diabetes education and that, how food really does affect me. I had a chocolate milk and it spiked to 15 millimoles. Did not expect that. I'm not having that again. It has made diabetes personal and it's shown me how it is my conscious decision to make some lifestyle changes in my life, for my life, and my family. So the second success story that I'd like to share relates to a 68-year-old woman who has had type 2 diabetes for 13 years. The patient has been on insulin and tablets for more than six years. And prior to her trial, she was asked numerous times the right questions, such as, have you ever suffered from low blood sugar levels? Or have you ever felt shaky or sweaty? She always said no. So this patient joined the trial and it was found she was suffering from major lows on many of the nights. We reduced her nighttime insulin dramatically and after two weeks, the patient returned for a review. She said she was feeling much better and getting more sleep. Now that her husband was no longer waking her up at night and giving her something to eat. So this graph here shows some of the lows that patient was having previously at night. So you can see um, the highest rate she was getting was 3.9 and she was going as low as 2.1 overnight. And our research has found that many of our older patients aren't registering these lows, especially throughout the night. So IWC is working to deliver solutions around diabetes and other, other initiatives we, we have include the Ideas Van, so our Indigenous health practitioners are performing retinal eye screening. We have a visiting endocrinologist, Dr. Tom Dover. Our Indigenous health practitioners walk alongside clients and work with our GPs, as well as the diabetes educator, dietitian, podiatrist, dental practice, pathology, and we are currently building a major expansion of our health and wellbeing facility, which will mean further growth in our services to support patients with diabetes and other chronic diseases. So just some quick facts around the liver reader. So right now, the um, liver reader costs around $95 for the sensor and another $95 for the reader. So the sensor lasts for around a fortnight but the equipment is being upgraded and improved right now. So the Libra um, Advert Australia has released an app that will do the work or the job of the reader. Also, we have some research here that we found to be relevant around nighttime lows. You two may find it interesting. Because at first we didn't really believe the data we were collecting from our patients. But the more um, you know, patients we got on board, the more lows we were identifying. So now I'd like to introduce Leanne Connors. Um, she works with the IWC and um, she is wearing a liver sensor. And Leanne can talk about the liver sensor from a patient's perspective. Thank you, Leanne, for coming up. So how long have you been, have you been diabetic? I was di diagnosed by our, our health workers, <coughs> sorry, excuse me, about seven years ago. Lise was actually one of the health workers that helped way back when she was only doing her Cert 3. We had a bit of a challenge at work, a weight loss challenge, where each week we'd get weighed, we'd have our blood pressure taken and we'd have our blood glucose levels. My levels were continually high, so um, they talked to the diabetes educator on my part and they said, get it straight to a doctor. And that's when I was diagnosed, I had no idea. So um, these girls literally saved my life because it would have gone unchecked by me because I'm very non-compliant. <laughs> <laughs> and because I am very non-compliant, this is a godsend. So you know, just show us how you use it, Leanne, like with it in your arm. Turn it on. Through anything I wear, it, I've got the sound turned off so it just vibrates in my hand and it gives me a reading. My current reading is 5.9. Without this, um, so it's on a straight at the moment because I just had morning tea, but it was dropping rapidly till I had morning tea. What I have learned is that I did experience a lot of nighttime 
activity and lows that I had no idea that I was experiencing. And it, you can't hide from it. If I go and have a handful of lollies, vumpo, it's going to spike. And then my doctor will look, look at my analysis and say, so what's been happening here? And I have to confess my sins. <laughs> and um, being a diabetic with a sweet tooth, they don't go hand in hand. But this has taught me that I can't just do what I want because my, my health is more important than eating the lollies, to be honest. Uh, with the app, what Kirsty was talking about earlier, um, you can actually log in to a site and monitor the patient's data while they're at home still with the sensor on, which is amazing, so which is good, and see if they are using it, you know, but yeah. Thank you, Leanne. I think that was all about it. Any questions? The, um, yeah. the two weeks, yeah. um, our diabetes educator looks at it and then she goes through it and analyzes it and then goes back to our GP, the patient's GP, and says, look, they've been having high hypos. I think they are talking with Kathy and Craig, IT support, to sort of upload, because it's too big, the file's too big and it'll take up too much room in our best practice. Yeah. But I think that they upload the, re the, the, the one that they, you know, yeah. start and requires. Unfortunately, so if we like the the 68 year old that we had, and she was having the nighttime um, hypos, we put in another request and said to them, you know, we need to do another two week trial to see how her levels have changed by having the insulin for that changing the, the amount of insulin she has. But unfortunately, no. So it's a shame because you know we need it on the PBS. PBS, yes. Uh, I'd like to wait for that. So, did any of the um, patients continue paying for their? Uh, we actually have. Um, we do have five patients that um, our diabetes educator is working with now who's um, linking them up with the reader and they're going to continue to purchase the sensors. Yeah, yeah. So, so, so we've empowered so those patients yeah, to you know, yeah. continue the work. So the readers are one off? Yes, the reader. Yeah. Like IWC purchased two readers so we could get the program started and then the ITC funding covers the costs of this two-week trial for the patient. Yeah. So they'll just use their phone if they have a, a, a smartphone. Look, for depending where you work, and look, there's many Indigenous patients that may be able to access funding to assist with the cost of some of this stuff through, like, the ITC programs. But, you know, that's on a, a mixed scale, mm. of course. Uh, but generally having been involved in this area for many years is that most people who have been sent away to do the finger pricking have not maintained it mm. or all don't see the relevance in it yeah. and therefore missing the point so we decided to trial this and you know we were able to get some of this stuff through some of those funded programs for the people who couldn't afford it and so on um, but it's a bit of a mixed bag because we don't, don't actually control the funding. Um, but if we did, I'd get one for everyone who had it. Because the fact is that what this is, is that this is actually demonstrating to the client and we're, we're, we're saying here that the clients that we're working with who may have been finger prick or supposed to be finger pricking, that's the word, not they should have been, but they weren't, and now realising the importance of it. Yeah. And they're not having to be reminded to do that. And, you know, and really there's many like benefits. Say, you've got to see that spike with the handful of... That's yes. how I went to yeah. you, and yeah. I have to live and see yeah. that before yeah. it makes yeah. sense. Yeah. And, and the funny thing is, some of this stuff with uh, Indigenous people pricking themselves, it's not, uh, it's not necessarily culturally 
we get acceptable. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So the, 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 again, it's a mainstream mainstream yes. method applied to indigenous communities. Yeah. Yeah. And this, this, yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, I think it's I'm a diabetes educator as well as a chronic disease coordinator, and I think it's fantastic what you've done. It's just amazing because I know our clients um, see diabetes as just sugar in the blood, and that's not important. Mm. Um, so I, I think it's fantastic what you've done, and, and I, I was just thinking of another thing is the continuous glucose monitoring system where they just wear it for three days, um, whether that's another avenue you could possibly look down and, um, you know, perhaps sort of every six to eight weeks. I'm, I'm just mm -hmm. throwing it out there yeah. because it's possibly um, uh, probably cheaper than the liver at the moment until the PPS improves and yeah. it makes the liver cheaper. That's, that's yeah. So with the um, findings of the trial, is, has that been recorded on? Like, is that going up to anyone to decision makers around some CBS and stuff? Or are you just doing that purely? Yeah, we just, just did it within our so, own for now. Yep, yep. Yeah, so so and you were typing it through the ITC. I to buy the purchase of those, yeah. That's not ongoing. That's not happening. We'll continue to do it with our patients. We've got a whole heap in the cupboard ready to go again for it's our next slide. It's holistic life. care, isn't it? Yep. I mean, yeah. Yeah. Obviously Improvements in HBA1C? Yes, 1.7%. Yeah. Overall, so that's overall, overall patients. Yeah. That's huge. Mm -hmm. Huge, yeah. Yeah, well, yeah. Thank you. Thank you.